Fast Talk is made possible by KPP Financial, a registered investment advisor firm serving clients throughout the United States. The clarity for your path forward starts now. Here is KPP Chief Executive Officer, Financial Advisor, Justin Klein. Good afternoon, fellow investors, and welcome back to Invest Talk. This is our Friday, September 22nd, 2023 edition. I'm Justin Klein, and this is our final session for the week, a session that is designed to help you become a better investor, take that next step in your educational journey, it's one that never stops, never sleeps. You always have to be on top of the data and the perspective so that you understand the risks and rewards that are out there in the marketplace. And I'm going to do that by giving you useful data and my unbiased perspective developed with over 20 years of investment experience. Now, we're going to talk about the market performance, rundown show topics, but we're going to hit our first listener question as usual right now at 888 chart Hey, Steve, Justin. This is Vishnu calling from New Jersey. I want to know what's your opinion on uh, Intuitive Surgical, ticker symbol ISRG. I'm holding a small position in the stock, and I want to know if I should buy more or just hold. Thank you. All right, looking at Intuitive Surgical, and this is one of those names that's been a secular grower throughout the years. Its earnings back in 2016 were only $2.48. Now we're expected to earn $5.44 a share this year. And if you don't know what they do, they make robots that allow surgeons to do minimally invasive surgery. And they pretty much have a lock on the market. There have been other competitors that are trying to put in similar type of systems, develop similar type of systems, but intuitive surgical is still at the very top. So it's a very good business. It has what we call a very good economic moat. And profitability has always been pretty solid, but you not as high as you would imagine. Still kind of in the mid-teens range on average over the last decade, which is good. You know, that's good. But with such a strong economic moat, you would imagine that that might be a bit higher. So overall, very, very good business. The main issue here is that it is trading at a pretty high multiple. Now, they have a fantastic balance sheet, zero long-term debt, and they have roughly – $7 billion in net debt just sitting on their balance sheet. And it's about a $100 billion market cap. So enterprise value is only about 94, market cap 101. So price to cash flow, though, is 87 times. Enterprise value to EBITDA, 47 times, very high. Price to sales, 14 times. <clears throat> and that's the issue here. It's just the multiples trading at in a rising rate environment means that multiple is going to be under pressure. Remember, any asset is the present value of future cash flows. And so when there's a certain level of growth built in, I would say a high level of growth built into the expectations, then current multiples can be pretty high. And that's my that's my issue here is that the multiple is very high and growth has actually been relatively slow over the past couple of years. Only on average around 10% sales growth over the last, uh, let's call it five, six quarters. And that's an issue. So are you really going to pay this high of a multiple for a name that's growing earnings only in the low teens going forward on average? That's not amazing growth. And that's ultimately the the problem. And so I would pass on this for now. Uh, the technicals are certainly weak. It peaked around 360 back in mid-July. Now we're at 288. And we're knocking on that 200-day moving average. And it's hit it twice and it looks like it will fail. So I like the name. It certainly should be on a watch list at the right price. But it just needs to be much, much cheaper for me to get on board with Intuitive Surgical. All right, now we have a lot of ground to cover in the next 45 minutes, and here is what I have planned. Our main focus point is in regards to the emerging technology that will make EV owner ownership practical. Okay, so we're going to look at the charging infrastructure build-out mainly, and that is what is needed to 
make all of this work, make people comfortable buying EVs. So we're going to look at that topic. Also, we want to touch on renewable energy and the costs involved. And it's important to understand the, which energy sources have variable costs, high variable costs, and high fixed costs, and vice versa. Because each type will work in various economic environments, industry environments, and in different parts of the world as well. So we're going to look at that. Also, warehouses. Warehouse pricing has weakened a bit, but overall, they're escaping a lot of the commercial real estate problems. We're going to talk about why that is. And then lastly, we're going to touch on how central banks are going to achieve this last phase of getting interest rates or not interest rates, inflation down to their targets. Inflation has come down a lot. Peaked around roughly 9% last year. Now we're closer to the 4% range, you know, kind of at some numbers a little bit more than four. Some are a little bit lower than four, but kind of in that three and a half to four and a half range is kind of where we're at now, which is much higher than we've all expected. And that but much higher than so that 2% target. So how are they going to get there after ramping rates up so dramatically? So we're going to look at that story. We also have some voice bank questions ready to play. One is in regards to Pfizer and investing for your children's future. Now, I also have some iTunes review questions to get to. And since it's Friday, we will share some brief excerpts from the newest KPP premium newsletter. Now, let's hit on the market performance for today. Right now, we had a mixed bag overall. We did close modestly lower after a strong down day yesterday. Large caps are down about 21 basis points, and small caps were also down about 21 basis points. Mid caps did the best, down only 17 basis points. So just a a modest down day overall. Tesla was down 4% itself. You had, uh, let's see, any other big notable losers Scholastics Corporation to Hertz was down 10.6%. Norwegian Cruise Lines down 7 Rumble down 7 uh, Interesting. It's always good to see these major movers up and down. But overall, it's really an adjustment. The market is adjusting to these new higher interest rates and a and central banks that are, are have, there's a mixed bag. A lot in Europe are pausing. Japan is talking about raising rates, but they just had one. They had a meeting, I believe it was yesterday, and they didn't do anything. And they didn't hint at raising rates. Only our Fed is hinting at maybe raising rates again this year. But a lot will depend on what happens overall in the economy and what that's telling about a hard or soft landing. It's pretty clear that the... Dynamics in regards to inflation adjustments within the economy and higher interest rates have actually had more of an inflationary impact so far this year than a deflationary one. For example, tax brackets. Tax brackets moved up. They're inflation adjusted. And so even if you – for a lot of people, even if they didn't get a raise, they got a raise by lowering their tax bracket. So that's number one. Number two is 60 million Americans got a, what is it, 8.5% increase in Social Security? That's a lot. Then you have people earning a bunch on cash for the first time in a long time. And so there's just more money going around in the economy and higher deficits. We're at a $2 trillion deficit. We're at recession-like deficit numbers, which is obviously inflationary. So while you, you know, certain parts of the economy that have higher interest rates, yes, that's deflationary, but there's so many factors that are keeping the dollars in the system flowing. And that's why it's hard to get a major decline in markets without a major deflationary impulse, deflationary impulse. And, you know, the Fed can talk about raising rates, but there's more of a balance now between how much raising rates really crimps financial conditions and it really hasn't to a large degree all right now if we go to a break let's let me remind let me remind you that you can check out our new invest talk classroom series it is streaming now on 
YouTube for free. It's our YouTube channel. It's episode seven. It's titled Cryptocurrency Deep Dive. So learn more about cryptocurrency. Just search Invest.Classroom over on YouTube. And now the phone lines are open, waiting for your questions at 888-99-CHART. When listener questions are played on the Invest Talk podcast, how do you guys determine a value stock? The caller voices are amplified many thousands of times. Just wanted to get your opinion on JP Morgan and BAC. How do you see this uh, looking forward? I'm 25 years old and have a question about retirement funds. And the unbiased answers from Justin Klein. That's why it's trading so cheap because there's a lot of regulatory risk. And Steve Peasley. I, I kind of like it here if i was going to buy tyson food this is where i'd buy it benefit the entire invest talk community thank you for what you guys do that's why 24 7 rain or shine no matter how simple or how complex your questions make a difference symbol bke what's your outlook and invest talk is made better by the power of you so don't forget to call 888-99-CHART Justin Klein is here and ready to take your calls live. Invest Talk, 888-99 chart. All right, now my focus point today looks into this story, and that is about can emerging technologies make EV ownership practical? And this is really all about charging infrastructure. And automakers are spending a ton of money to transition to new electric vehicles. Ford is spending $50 billion through 2026 to ramp up EV production. General Motors, $35 billion. And Volkswagen, $200 billion over the next five years. But Americans, by and large, are still relatively hesitant. And a lot of that has to do with charging networks. Now, a June study by Cox Automotive found that 32% of customers who were considering EV cited a lack of charging stations in my area as a barrier to their purchase. Another study by Consumer Reports in April found that that charging logistics and purchase price were the two biggest factors holding back consumers from buying EVs. An April poll by the Energy Policy Institute out of the University of Chicago, they found that 47% of U.S. adults said that that it's not likely that they would buy an EV as their next car, with nearly 80% of those saying that it was a lack of charging stations as a factor. Now, that's a big problem. And the, the main issue here is that a lot of this is perceived. And how do you change that perception? And why do I say it's perceived? It's because most owners, they charge at home. They have some sort of level two home charging charger that's provided by the company they bought their EV from or some sort of third party. But that doesn't work for everybody. If you live in an apartment, for example, most apartment complexes don't have EV chargers set up in their carport or even in a garage if they have a garage. Now, some EV motorists, they charge at work and there's workplace parking lots. You can charge at hotels, shopping centers, etc. But you need a fast charger typically to make that a reasonable a way to charge because most home chargers, they take hours to charge, but it's all about the fast charging networks. Now the cost of fast charging varies by time and location. It's usually cheaper than the tank of gas, which most people like, but there's only about 33 public fast chargers throughout the United States. And 21,000 of those are Tesla superchargers. And the issue has to do with reliability, okay? Because a lot of those chargers, even the Tesla chargers, aren't that reliable. And there's kind of a patchwork of these charger systems. They call them combined charging systems, CCS. 
And a study by the University of Berkeley checked 675 of them in the Bay Area, found that almost a quarter of them weren't functional. And there are fewer than 12,000 fast chargers across the United States. CCS fast chargers, meaning compatible with really any EV. And this is why I say it's going to take, I think, a lot longer for EVs to get adopted. Because it works for some people, but not for a lot of other people. And then the cost, they're just way too expensive. And that cost is not really going down anymore. It's actually starting to go up. All right, we're heading to a quick break. I'm ready for your calls now at 888-99-CHART. You've got finance and investment questions, and Justin Klein and Steve Peasley are ready with their unbiased answers. Don't forget to call InvestTalk, 888-99-CHART. Hi there. Love the the show. I've learned a lot. Thanks for all you guys do. Just had a question about a value play and I kind of wanted your opinions on which might be the better route here or if it's kind of a toss up or what, but I'm looking at opening a position in either Pfizer, PFE or Kraft Heinz, KHC. Both of them have been pretty beaten up kind of wanted to do a value play and just wanted to get your thoughts on uh, if you liked one over the other. Thanks. Bye. All right. This is Pfizer. Pfizer, I've said for a while, it's a stone cold short along with Moderna. The demand for the vaccines just naturally has waned. There it was the initial uptake. And as more data comes out, it doesn't seem to have a very good efficacy, especially when it comes to preventing contraction of COVID and there's a lot of risks still in, you know, unknown kind of long-term uh, risks involved. And it's pretty clear the risk versus reward for the vast majority of people just really isn't there. And that's why the uptakes of the boosters just aren't there, especially for people, you know, under the age of 60, even 50. So, you know, <clears throat> this is definitely not a place to be. It's peaked around 60. Now we're at 32 earnings are expected to fall to, $3.30 this year from $6.58 last year. And pre-pandemic, they were earning $1.91. It looks like they're headed back there. So uh, absolutely would not touch Pfizer. I think it's a stone cold short. Hi, now, now, KHC is another story here. Kraft Heinz, it is a name that has a wonderful, consistent business, but it is a slow grower. So you're not going to pay a high multiple. It's going to always look like a value stock because it just doesn't have a lot of top line growth. More most people have ketchup in their fridge. You're not really going to grow that market. Okay, so and they have a lot of debt. 20 billion dollars in net debt in its balance sheet. The technicals are not great. You're talking about a relative strength number. Where are we at? 33. It's pretty bad. It just recently rallied to its 50-day moving average, which is nice, but it's still in a downtrend. And I don't like that. Its enterprise value to EBITDA is 11, which is relatively low. But, you know, once again, it's a slow grower with a lot of debt. So I don't find that a bargain basement price. Price to book is eh, the price to book is good, but once again, that's not accounting earn, uh, the debt. I I don't know. I just I don't find it attractive. There's other better names here. Uh, it's cash to pay ratio is 86, percent so it's paying out a lot of that cash flow to the dividend, and there's not a lot of room for that dividend to grow. It's not issuing more shares or buying back more shares. Its long-term debt is declining some, but not really this year. So overall, the picture here is kind of murky, not amazing. Neither one of these are great value plays in my mind. Okay. All right, let's touch on renewable energy, renewable energy. And whether you pump a barrel of oil at 2 a.m. or 2 p.m. or any time of the day, no matter what, it has the same 
amount of energy and value that it can produce for the end consumer. But for other types of clean energy, that can be more difficult to kind of put a value on. Because peak demand is midday. And say it's wind, for example. Is it windier during the day or at night? Typically more at night. When the demand is lower. And while the cost of wind and solar has fallen consistently throughout the years, that's starting to change. Now, the 2014, the levelized cost of offshore wind was around $200 per megawatt hour. But that has fallen to $127. But many of the offshore wind projects are having trouble. Trouble being profitable. And the main reason is, well, that sounds like a big decline, 200 to 127. We're talking nearly a 40% decline or, yeah, nearly a 40% decline in just a handful of years. That levelized cost is much higher than, say, nuclear, which is 91. Natural gas is 43. But then you have to look at natural gas and nuclear differently. The upfront costs of nuclear are very high, mainly because we don't produce a lot of those plants. But the ongoing costs, the variable costs of those plants, is very low. Uranium prices are going up, but still, in relation to how much energy you can put out, it's very cheap. Where natural gas plants, those are cheap to put up, but you're at the whims of the, nat- of the input of natural gas. And so the vast majority of the cost of natural gas electricity, produced electricity, is, is very high. So when you're looking at what's happening in this space, solar is actually pretty good, but it depends on where you're at. If you're here in California or Arizona, it's pretty cheap per megawatt hour. But if you're in the Northeast, for example, in Canada... It's not as good. So the moral of the story here is that you need a combination of both. And nuclear is the cheapest if you can scale the building of these facilities. All right, we're heading to a break. Give me a call at 888-99-CHART. For investors, the goal of achieving financial freedom requires unbiased information, strategic planning, and determination. Congratulations! You found the podcast that is dedicated to helping you succeed. Invest Talk. Let's go, Dr. Frank in San Rafael. I want to talk about Woodside Energy? Yeah. I've had it for a while, less than 1% of my stock portfolio, and uh, pays a good dividend, and, and I was just thinking of adding to it. What do you think of the company? I think you should sell it. Think so? Yes. Uh, it's underperforming the sector in a large way. Uh, someone called about this a few days ago, I think earlier this week, and this is an Australian-based EMP company. And historically, its profitability is much lower than its domestic peers. And you're just buying it for the dividend. And once again, that's not the way you invest. Don't invest for the dividend. You invest for the quality yeah, of the business. I, I, I didn't buy it for that. I bought okay. it when, when it was many years ago when it was two. Ah, gotcha. Okay. Well, you know, the dividend's all over the place and dividend is now declining. It was 12 cents back in 2021 when it went up to a dollar 44 earlier this year. Now it's down to 80 cents. And so it's going to be highly dependent on the price of energy. And that's, I like that it's variable to a degree because there are a lot of domestic companies that are doing this that are tying it to cash flow and things like that. But you know, the, the overall business is just much weaker than its counterparts. It's If you look over the long term, its return on equity is kind of in the high single digits. That's not great. That's pretty poor, actually, for the energy sector. So, And the technicals are weak. The relative strength here is 63. The XLE, the energy, broad-based energy ETF, is 84. So 
the overall technicals are poor. The business is subpar. And yes, you're going to get a lower dividend by buying something else domestically, probably, but you're going to get a dividend that's more sustainable. Um, so I don't like the technicals. I don't love the business. I would sell it and go buy a domestic name that has better longer term profitability. Okay. Thank you very much for your advice. No problem. Thanks for the call, Frank. Now, the KAPP Premium Newsletter was finished today, and it will be distributed to subscribers tomorrow morning. And I have a preview. Now, in the Marketing Conditions section, we explain that the Federal Reserve kept interest rates stable this week, but did incite a possible increase of 25 basis points before year end. And this decision to maintain their target rate, uh, it to, uh, allows it to uh, – allows it to uh, – let's see. Overall, the Federal Reserve expressed cautious optimism seeking a better understanding of inflation dynamics before making further policy adjustments. Now, it's important for investors to remember that ongoing labor, inflation, and consumer spending situation will continue to be closely monitored and may affect future decisions by the Fed. As always, the economic outlook is dynamic and not static. Now, on the labor side, recent unemployment data showed that renewed strength with the new unemployment claims falling to an eight-month low last week and this information comes amidst a slowing job market trend and recently a strike by the uaw has caused disruption in the automobile sector potentially leading to a rise in jobless claims in the coming weeks now the housing market is showing signs of struggling contrasting the different sectoral strength and weaknesses. Now, the increase in the mortgage rates align with the rising trend of the 10-year note hampered early stabilization efforts in the housing sector. And we're still emphasizing companies that show good relative value and have lower levels of debt that will need to be rolled over the next term as we continue to see growth names roll over. And we touch on the larger economic implications of the Fed meeting and the economic data in the newsletter. Now, stock ideas section, we highlight a company that sells liquid chromatography, mass spectrometry, and thermal analysis tools. These analytical instruments provide essential information on various products, such as molecular structures and physical properties. This helps clients enhance the health and wellness of its end users. And the company has maintained strong capital discipline and has preserved returns on invested capital near the top of the industry. And we expect that to continue. We also look at the world's largest and most diverse healthcare firm. Three divisions make up consumer, pharmaceutical, and medical devices and diagnostics. And just over half of their revenue is generated outside the United States. So we name names over in the newsletter. Now, let's grab another caller question at 888 chart Hi, good morning. My name is Robert. I was calling because I had a couple questions real quick. Uh, I just have a daughter not too long ago, and I also have a two-year-old. Or at least open up an account for them and start investing for them. And with that said, though, I'm wondering what kind of account would be best for them, and then, especially in this market right now. Obviously, you know we're in a, we are in what we in, but uh, I just want to get you guys' opinion on that. And I appreciate you guys. Thank you. Usually, the best would be a Nutma or a UGMA account. These are easy to open in most brokerage firms, and it depends on what your goals are, okay, and what state you're living in. Some states don't allow UTMAs, but uh, that's probably the best and easiest way to go. There's no contribution limits. Now, you could also open a 529 plan if you want to just focus on educational purposes for that money. So those are the main ones that you would want to open up for your children. And if they eventually have some sort of uh, income, Roth IRA might be good as well. All right. Well, let's head over to talk about warehouses, warehouse industry. Now, companies from e-commerce retailers to third-party logistics companies – They leased a ton of new office space during the pandemic, but that shift has has changed. You know, there's weaker freight demand, higher interest rates, and softer consumer spending. However, while the magnitude of demand has waned, overall demand remains relatively strong in this space. And companies are more... A little more cautious 
but they're still growing, growing their demand for warehouse space. Now, nationwide vacancies hit 3% late last year when there was the rush to fulfill all the e-commerce orders that people placed during the pandemic. And in some markets, like here in Southern California, it was effectively full. But once again, the demand has receded just a bit, but mainly back to historical standards. And warehouse rents keep climbing despite the lower demand overall. Now, logistic operators leased 205 million square feet in the second quarter. That was down from 235 million square feet in the same period last year, but still up significantly from the 135 million square feet in the second quarter of 2019. Okay, so that was the last pre-pandemic quarter that we can kind of look at. Now, what's driving this increased demand or stable demand? Let's just say that. Now, a lot of it has to do with companies looking to hold more inventory. They realized that they were too lean on inventory and a lot of things were out of stock. It's a lot harder to get what they want for their customers. So they're just keeping more on hand. Now, available warehouse capacity grew in August, but at a much slower pace than in July. And what you're seeing is that Amazon is pulling back their push for more warehouse space, but retailers like Target, Sam's Club, they're opening more logistics facilities for e-commerce. So kind of that second and third tier end users of warehouse space who kind of held off due to costs, they're coming back in. And then you have the reshoring and manufacturing. And that is demanding more warehouse space. And logistics providers are setting up distribution centers to serve these new facilities that are being set up. We talked about how the CapEx for manufacturing facilities is up 80% year over year, roughly. Now, manufacturers account for 8% of all warehouse leasing up to the middle of this year. That's up from 6.7% a year earlier. So this has less to do with those retailers and more about manufacturers, once again, keeping more on hand. Now, developers are the main ones pulling back. They started cutting back their plans most more recently, and mainly that has to do with higher borrowing costs. And this is a good example of why I say, in many ways, in some ways, higher interest rates is actually inflationary because if it cuts off capacity expansion, Increasing supply of certain goods and services, that's actually inflationary. So it can cut cut both ways. Now, about 110 million square feet of new space began construction in the second quarter. That's down 55% from a year earlier. And the shift in where things are stored is happening as well. So the five regions that started construction on the most new industrial space in the second quarter, Dallas, Fort Worth, number one, Phoenix, Savannah, Georgia, Chicago, and Atlanta. So what you can see is only one of those is here on the West coast. And a lot of it has to do with because of Phoenix being a hub for new manufacturing facilities on the West coast. Everything else is in the South or the Midwest and close to the East coast. So this is the picture of the commercial real estate market, certainly bucking the trends of the office space weaker than you've seen over the past couple of years, but still not bad, still in on solid footing. All right. Now Fridays, I generally make time for a quick rundown of some key benchmarks. The two-year treasury yield now up over 5%, 5 5.123% up from 5.03% last week, up nearly 10 basis points. Two weeks ago, it was below 5%, 4.96. And 78 weeks ago, it was at 1.96%. 91 weeks ago, it was below 1%, 0.64. Now, the 10-year, that one's up 4.4%. Hit nearly 4.5% yesterday, settled at that 4.4% mark. That's up from 88 weeks ago of 1.76%. 
Now, gold was at 1924 an ounce, pretty much flat on the week and up from 82 weeks ago when it was at 1806. And let's see, about 32 weeks back with that start of the year around 1865. So solid start to the year uh, for gold. Silver, 2354 an ounce. That's up a tad from 2331 last week. And but 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 roughly flat from where we were actually flat to down from where 77 weeks ago is at 2394. So it's starting to outperform gold, and that is overall a good thing for the precious metal market. Now the oil settled at $90.25 per barrel, down slightly from last week at 9077, but it was a bit a bit overbought and up nicely from just 26 weeks ago when it was at 66.83. All right, the national average for gasoline prices $3.85 down a cent from last week, but up from 3.57.84 weeks ago. Now here in California, average of $5.78 $5.78 per gallon up from 5.52 last week, but for comparison Texas Average only $3.39 per gallon. That's $2.39 cheaper than here in California. All right, let's keep things moving and pivot back to the Best Talk Voice Bank for a call from 888 chart Hi, Steve or Justin. This is Adam from St. Paul, Minnesota. Just had a question about Pinterest, ticker symbol P-I-N-S. I know this is one of those growth stocks that has been beat down quite a bit and was curious to get your take on financials and at these levels if you would be looking to accumulate a position. Um, I'm curious and looking to potentially buy. So I appreciate your response and hope you're having a good day. Thank you. All right. This is Pinterest, about an $18 billion market cap. Enterprise valued about $15.5 billion, so about $2.5 billion in net debt on its balance sheet. That's good. Price sales ratio about 6%. It's not 6%, 6, 6 multiple, which is still pretty high. And earnings are kind of all over the place. It made $1.13 in 2021, 62 cents last year. Supposed to make 98 cents this year, but those expectations are coming back down. The last five quarters, revenue growth was in the high single digits. So that that's not what I call a growth company. And five, four out of those five quarters, earnings were down double digits year over year. Only the last quarter did you have a bounce back in earnings, and that was mainly due to base effects. Now, if you look at the chart, it's it moved down big during the growth bust, shall we say, in it actually peaked in 2021. Strong downtrend through 2022 with the rest of the growth names and has rallied since the beginning of the year. However, not to a large degree. Start of the year. What did we start the year? Let's see what that price is. Around 23 and change. Now we're at 26 and change. Yeah, it's a good rally, but certainly lagging its peers. And I'm just not paying this type of multiple. You're looking at its free cash flow around 370 million. That gives it a free cash flow yield in the four to five percent range, which is not bad. It's not terrible for a growthier name, but is it a growth name anymore? When it's growing revenues in the single digits, I don't really call that a growth name anymore. You're kind of seeing what the levelized business looks like. Its free cash flow peaked at 743 million in the end of 2021, now it's at 370 million and declining. So where is that trend ultimately settle in out? I don't know. It's operating margins will be our negative 13%, return equity negative nine and a half percent. So I'm not buying this. The technicals are not great. The fundamentals still are not great. So I'm passing on Pinterest. All right, this is Invest Talk. I'm Justin Klein. We have one goal. Here is to help you achieve your own version of financial freedom. And our work continues after this final break. So get your questions in now at 888 chart Everybody wants a secure financial future. That means you'll have finance and investment questions. Justin Klein and Steve Peasley are ready to provide their unbiased answers. 
Invest Talk. 888-99-CHART. Hi, Invest Talk. I just had a question about utilities in general. Now that interest rates are high, you can get yields on bonds higher than utilities, and they've you know fallen out of favor, and the prices have dropped, and the yields on them have gone up, and not as close as to where some of the yields are at with some of the treasuries, but I'm um, still at a at a pretty good level. Do you guys think that utilities are a, a good investment? You know, have you guys ever owned utilities in your guys' clients' portfolios, or would you recommend staying clear of utilities? I just want to get your overall thoughts, not on any particular company, but just as a whole, or if you feel like there are some standouts, and good plays in the utility space. Thanks, as always. Listen on the show. Bye. Well, we certainly have owned utilities throughout the years to some degree, but we've never been big owners of them. Uh, we usually have some exposure to every sector. Right now, utilities are probably our lowest exposure, mainly because they are bond proxies, and that's why they have been taking on the chin for the better part of the last couple of years, especially this year. One of the worst sectors in the market so far year to date. Let's see, year to date, a one year return for utilities, negative 13%. Only real estate is in the negative territory one year. It's negative nine. Every other sector is up over the last year. So you can see how those companies that pay some sort of a healthy dividend and have very little growth. can act as bond proxies. Now, utilities suffer in higher interest environment because, like you said, they're competitors to bonds. And they also tend to be highly capital intensive. They need to have large facilities to administer their utilities, whether that's water, natural gas, electricity, etc. Now, the good thing is that overall inflation tends to feed into their cost. And so they can pass a little bit that of that along to their holders or not their holders, their customers, but not a lot of it. They tend to be their growth tends to be determined by the population growth in their area, not by inflation. And they tend to have a lot of debt and the dot debt costs tend to go up. So long term, I'm just it's it's one of the worst sectors in long term performance. Now in a recession, it's one of the best performers because the opposite happens, right? Where interest rates tend to go down, right? They're bond proxies, so they tend to rally. And then their earnings are stable because they're legislated in for the most part. While those around them, companies around them are seeing profits shrink. So should you have some utilities? I don't mind a, a sprinkle of some of the best in the best opportunities that are out there, but to be overweight them just doesn't make a whole lot of sense. All right, let's touch a bit on the last mile in the central bank's fight to get inflation to their 2% target. And what you're starting to see is that central banks around the world are Being careful. They're being careful. And this is what Jerome Powell said many times in the latest Fed meeting. They said they're proceeding carefully. He said that six times. And he said that we're navigating by the stars under cloudy skies. And he's not the only one. Christine Lagarde, Christine Lagarde over in France or in the ECB said, I know it's complicated. And this is because there's a lot of headwinds, weak growth, and a global economy that is becoming more fragmented. So it makes it difficult for them to see there's a lot of fog ahead. Even the UK, in their latest meeting, the, there was a five to four vote on to keep rates the same. So there's a lot of uncertainty there. And so when you're trying to figure out what central banks are doing, especially the Fed going forward, and you're confused and the market looks confused, 
it's probably because they're confused. This is a new environment that most people haven't dealt with. This is more akin to the 1960s in the way the economy is being run with a lot of spending, different demographic situation with less workers, lower unemployment, structural, structurally low unemployment. And that's the environment that you have to now work with. This isn't the 2000s. This isn't the 2010s. This is the 2020s. And if you want to know how to navigate it, go look at the 1960s. All right. I'm Justin Klein. This completes another Invest Talk program. Steve Peasley and I thank you for listening. And we encourage you to tell your friends and family about our free podcast downloads, which you can find anytime at iTunes, Spotify, or Google Play. And it's official. We have now surpassed the 55.8 million podcast download mark since it all began. Independent thinking, shared success. This is Invest Talk. Good night. Invest Talk is a trademark of KPP Financial. Because of the nature of the interactive dialogue inherent in the format of this program, it's important for the listener to understand that not all comments made will apply to them. Specifically, nothing said shall be taken to be investment advice, or shall statements on this program be considered an offer to buy or sell security. Because such advice is rendered solely on an individual basis, and at times will require that the investor review a prospectus before investing. InvestTalk is a copyrighted program of Klein.